My first guest tonight has his finger on the pulse of what's happening at the Capitol these days. Tom Libis is the Senate Deputy Majority Leader. He is joining us tonight from the State Capitol. Senator, how are you? I'm great, Liz. How are you? I'm well. It's good to see you. It is good to see you. We have a lot going on, actually, so I'd like to get started with sort of the issue du jour, except it's been the <laughs> issue of the week, really. Uh, it's redistricting. Sure. And, and I understand that your conference is looking for more time, despite the fact that you signed those pledges that Ed Koch keeps talking about. About. Yeah, we, we are looking for some time, and I think, uh, you know, before we get all over with, we'll have a, a good, uh, a comprehensive, independent redistricting bill that we can move forward. But, you know, we're going we're gonna to do it when we're ready. We're not going to do it when Ed Koch is ready or when the Senate Democrats, who had two years to do something, uh, feel that it, it needs to be done. But we'll get there. So the Senate Democrats are actually asking and really trying to force a public hearing by petitioning for one through the Rules Committee. Why not just let that happen and have people sound off um, and, and not, you know, and not put your vote on something that makes it look like you're voting no? Yeah. The well, the first thing the Senate Democrats did today, Liz, I don't know if you read their letter. They sent a letter to me. The letter should have gone to the clerk of the committee. Mm. Uh, it said so right in the rule that they, they uh, you know, uh, referred to. So I think they need to read the rules first. And, and go through the process correctly. But uh, you know what? The, the governor's bill is in rules right now. Uh, you know, we may come up with something even different than the governor's bill. So um, it's not uncommon. It's been this way for a number of years where uh, a bill goes into rules and, um, you know, it gets discussed at some point. But look, at, we, we are uh, committed. We signed a pledge. We understand that. And at the end of the day, uh, we believe that we'll move forward on something that's going to be independent um, when it comes to redistricting. And you think that's going to be probably through a constitutional amendment? Uh, I, my guess is it might be. It might be. We're, we're looking at a number of things right now. Obviously, you know, even the Koch pledge said uh, constitutionally fair. We understood that. But um, we've talked about constitutional amendment. We've talked about a number of things. Um, we're we're going to move forward on the issue. We understand that it's uh, an issue that needs to be dealt with over the course of the next 18 months. You know, Liz, we don't even, as you know, we don't even have the, the census figures yet. Yep, so I know. everybody's getting excited. Be patient. We've got a budget to deal with, you know, taxes, spending, jobs. Let me put it to you this way. We had the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Binghamton Saturday. It was a great day, 40,000 people. Nobody ran up to me and said, get the redistricting bill done. They, they need jobs. They want their taxes cut. Okay, so be before we leave the issue, though, on the, on the question of prisoners and where they're counted, this was something that the Democrats did before they lost control of the chamber, having prisoners counted at their last home address and not where they're currently residing, which, of course, makes a difference when it comes to the size of a district, most of which are controlled by the Republicans upstate because that's where most of the prisons are. Um, you guys have talked about, uh, questioned the constitutionality of that particular measure, and you've talked about suing over it. Are you going to? Well, the move by the Democrats was purely political for the exact reason, Liz, that you mentioned, that it would, would, would hurt Republican districts. Um, our lawyers are talking about it now. I can't sit here and tell you, yes, we're definitely going to file a suit, uh, but I can also tell you that we're, we're, we're looking at a whole host of things. Uh, we think it hurts us. We think it was unfair that they did it, and um, a suit may be one of the issues that we deal with. I mean, yeah, it's interesting that when you put it that way, you think that it hurts you. I mean, you're certainly not making any uh, uh, secret of the que of the issue here, which is it is a political issue. That's what redistricting is all about. It's about politics. Well, right? it is about politics, and and you know what, Liz? People seem to forget that the you know many of the people that are watching this broadcast are people uh, from upstate New York and the Hudson Valley, and uh, I'm very concerned about fair representation in upstate New York and the Hudson Valley, and uh, certainly uh, you remember when. Malcolm Smith made his, who was the Democratic leader at the time, said, uh, when we win the majority, we will redistrict the Republicans into oblivion. Liz, you're right. It is very political. Uh, and it's about survival of, um, of a number of things. And so I think we just have to go slow and make sure we do it right. On prisons, then, have you made any more movement in terms of what you're going to do there? Look, the, the bottom line is the Assembly is going to put its budget forward. The, the Senate's going to put yeah. its budget forward. The governor has already put his budget forward. He has said... He is open to the idea that the legislators would put prisons for a closure into their own budget proposals, but I can't see that that would be something that the Senate Republicans would do. We've had uh, discussions with the governor on this issue. We are putting together some internal plans. Uh, the Republican conference understands that the state is broke and it has no money, and uh, we're willing to do our fair share, and we recognize that prisons may be a part of that. It's certainly a tough issue for us. Uh, nobody's going to say it's not, but um, we also understand that 
that we've got to make tough decisions here. And uh, this state, we have to have a budget on time. And, uh, you know, reducing the size of the prisons is going to be part of it. And uh, I think we're up to the task, and we're going to do what we can. When you say that you recognize that reducing the size of the prisons is necessary, does that mean that you recognize that closure in, is actually going to be on the table? Actual closure of facilities? Well, you know, it, it might be. But, you know, it's funny, uh, Liz, the, the commissioner talks about the uh, fact that we, we could use another maximum facility prison uh, that should be built in the state. So, um, you know, I, I think everything is on the table at this point. Uh, we, we understand that um, we've got to make some uh, real changes in this area. But, um, you know, uh, for me to predict any one thing, I think, would be way premature. We've got three weeks left. And as you know, in Albany, three weeks is an eternity. Every day is an eternity in That's Albany, right. actually, Senator. What, what is the timing in terms of the Senate's budget? When will that come out? Um, on the 15th, which I believe is next Monday, if I'm yep. correct. And uh, we, will, we will do our one-house budget on the 15th. I think the Assembly will do the same. And then we will begin the process of the conference committees. Okay. Will you, as Sen uh, actually Senate Majority Leader Dean Skelis said last week, that he thought that he would put the LIFO bill that was passed by your house fairly narrowly, actually, by, by just one vote. I mean, he would put that in the budget proposal because it's clear that, that the governor ha wants to go his own way and uh, Mayor Bloomberg is not pleased about that. You know, I, I'm not sure whether that's going to happen. Uh, you know, if the governor, or I'm sorry, if the leader said he's uh, giving it serious consideration, he's the leader, and at the end of the day, uh, on Monday when the bills come out, uh, if it's in there, it's because he chose to do that. So, um, you know, we haven't had those conversations in conference, uh, but if he wants to put it in, that's his prerogative as leader, and it'll be in the one-house bill. Why is it, do you think, that the governor decided right after you passed that bill in your house to do away with last and first out well, to go his own way? I didn't think he thought we would pass it. I, I really didn't think he, he believed that we would actually pass it. What? That, why, why that's, not? Just, that's just my humble opinion. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think, uh, you know, so far we have uh, done a number of things that the governor uh, has given us. You know, um, we, we passed the election bill that, that he gave us. Uh, we are going to pass, I think, Power for Jobs tomorrow. Uh, that will be the third governor's program bill. The Assembly has only done one. Uh, and I think maybe we're surprising him a little bit that the Senate actually wants to move uh, in a positive direction, and we're willing to work with him. And I think that makes people... Uh, sometimes wonder or suspicious and I think last week when we passed this bill um, I don't think the governor or probably too many people in the capital thought it was going to pass. Okay but just to be clear the LIFO bill was not the governor's bill. The LIFO oh. bill was a bill that only dealt with New York City and uh, it was at true. the behest of Mayor Bloomberg. Okay. No, that's okay. true. I'm just saying I think people are surprised at what the Senate's doing. The Senate has already passed you know uh, we'll, we'll pass as of tomorrow uh, you know three of the governor's program bills. We passed this particular bill which was not a governor's bill but I think he was surprised that we actually passed it. Okay, so you don't think that it was, as some people have accused him, some kind of concession to the unions? You'd have to ask him that question, not me. Okay. Uh, in terms of that, though, I mean, some of the speculation has been that it had something to do with education aid and hoping that the teachers' unions would actually stop advocating as strongly as they have been about putting back some of that education aid money. That's a big deal for your conference, particularly the nine, those Long Island nine. Well, it, it is. It is, Liz. And as, as someone who represents the southern tier, uh, my rural school districts uh, are hurt in this budget, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm very concerned about them. And uh, um, you know, uh, it's important for me to see that if there is any movement of money, you notice I didn't say any extra money because we don't believe there will be, if there is movement of money that that movement can go to my rural school districts. Yeah, but doesn't that actually put you at odds with some of your fellow senators? Because the Long Islanders would like to keep their shares. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about shares sure, of sure. money, right? Actually, if you look at the governor's budget, uh, New York City did better than upstate Long Island this time. In the mm -hmm. past, they usually uh, front load Long Island. He didn't do that in this budget. Um, you look at at the end of the day, our conference, our Republican conference, has come together. Uh, we we disagree behind closed doors. We may argue a little bit. Everybody is there representing their own constituency. But at the end of the day, we come out together, and I think we proved that again last week when we voted on the LIFO bill. So what's likely, though, is when you do put together this one-house budget, that there might be a different allocation of education aid shares than what the governor has proposed? Uh, that's, that's possible. That's possible. But, um, you know, really, the, the final outcome, education, as you know, the numbers, uh, you never see them until the very end. Even when, when a final budget agreement is done, they come out at the end. Um, you know, we, we know that we need to do something to help rural school districts in, in upstate New York. Do you think you might find some sort of new revenue generator in your budget? 
Um, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I just don't think it's there. We, we have been, all of our conversations internally have been moving around money. Certainly, you know, the governor has the right to give us his budget. We don't always have to agree with what he wants to spend the money on. Uh, we have priorities that we'd like to spend the money on. That's why we do our one house bill. The assembly will do their bill. Let me tell you what's very good this year, Liz. Um, you know, the governor's been very engaging. He's engaging with individual members, the leaders. Uh, the conversations are going on. That, that always hasn't happened in the past. And, and I believe that's going to help us to get a non-time budget. I know people don't believe what I'm saying, but I believe it'll help us get a non-time budget because the governor is engaged. Whether you agree or disagree with him, uh, he's keeping the process moving. Well, he's made it quite clear that he's willing to, if you don't have an on-time budget agreement, put what he wants into the budget extenders, much like well, David Patterson did. Yeah, that's true. But, but you know, I, I, there's, there's a different environment. I mean, Senator Scalos made a commitment when we took over the majority that uh, we're going to do everything we can to get a non-time budget budget. He said that publicly. I've said it publicly. Our conference is saying it. Um, you know, I believe even the speaker wants to get a non-time budget. I mean, he's made those comments. Uh, I think it's going to happen, uh, not without, I'm sure, without a little bloodshed. As I said, we've got three weeks to go, but uh, I believe it's going to happen. And just in, 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 in finally, millionaire's tax, you haven't changed your mind about that particular topic. Liz, a tax is a tax, and no matter uh, who you tax, it's detrimental to the state. You know, the governor campaign has said no taxes. Uh, we said no taxes. Um, you know what? When, when, when millionaires leave the state, the money that they pay in personal income tax ends up being paid by the middle class. So, you know, tax is a tax is a tax. And uh, a millionaire's tax really isn't a millionaire's tax. It taxes people on incomes of 200000 Well, that's certainly a substantial amount of money compared to what a lot of my constituents make. Uh, at the same time, it pushes people out of the state. Okay. We don't need any more taxes. Okay, so no movement on that because the Assembly Democrats are definitely putting that into their budget. Well, I think they're making a mistake if they do. I think the, the public, both Republican, Democrat, Independent, Conservative, they're fed up with taxes on everybody. Mm, but public polls say that they actually support a millionaire's tax. Well, you know, that's if you read polls, and, you know, sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. Ah, uh, okay, selective poll reading. You heard this it here. <laughs> selective poll reading, but I'm talking about principle. I mean, if you're going to do no taxes, you have to do no taxes. I hear you loud and clear, Senator. Okay, okay. Tom Levis, thanks very much for joining us. I appreciate your time. Liz, always a place. pleasure. Always a pleasure to be with you. Be well, sir. Thank you.